give a hand for ourselves for the USO event. Yeah. Let's give a hand to Amanda, who held it down like a champ. Awesome and crazy and cool, and the word has spread like wildfire. Every other fellowship wants to be a part of our next USO deal, which is great. Awesome. So, and a little side note this was a kind of a digression from what I wanted to teach, but it's just a verse that I think is important to remember. Let's go to Psalms 105, and this is just a little ditty at the beginning of this teaching. And, uh, it says in Psalms 105, verse 1, and it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Uh, proclaim the good works of God. Now that doesn't just mean the things that God has done that we read about in his work. That means the great things that he has done in our lives now, in the lives of our friends, in the lives of our parents, you name it. Just proclaim. Uh, certain Circles have things against testimonies. I don't. Because of this verse. Make known his deeds. Proclaim them a bunch. And so, I just felt like that was something cool to remember. And something that I think all of you know. And if you don't know, you'll know now. You have an opportunity to do here. So if you have anything, any victory in your life, anything worth proclaiming, uh, God's good works and good things about, like the $2 raise, which is awesome, uh, let us know, because, uh, $3 raise, uh, because that's not only good, it's biblical, and it's awesome, it's inspiring, it's motivating, sharing stories of victory in our lives now with each other is important and great. So, let's go to the real teaching that I have prepared, let's go to John 10. How many of y'all know that the Bible doesn't change? Can't compare that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> this, is, this is too much. The Bible doesn't change, right? And how many of y'all know that when we go to the Bible, we change? Amen. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So we can go to the Bible tonight. In John... Chapter 10, it says in verse 9, it says, I am the door, this is Jesus Christ speaking, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find what? Pasture. Pasture. He's going to find green land, he's going to find food, he's going to find security and peace and comfort. He'll find pasture when he comes to Christ. Verse 10. The thief comes not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it what? More abundantly. More abundantly. So if there's a bunch of stealing and killing and destruction happening in your life, you know it's not from God. It's the calling card of the adversary. And when you see things like that happening, the adversary is not too far away from that. But Jesus Christ came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Now, the word abundant already implies more than enough, right? Abundant alone. It, it, it doesn't say that you might have life more redundantly, does it? It says more abundant. <laughs> yeah. so, so already abundantly is more than enough, that you would have life in a bigger fashion than what is necessary just for your needs. Um, but it doesn't just say abundantly. It says more abundantly. Uh, you could say this as Jesus Christ came that we could have life and that we could have it more than more than enough. Uh, the Greek word for more than abundantly is the word parizo. And this word means exceeding some number or measure or rank or need. 
exceeding need. Over and above, more than is necessary, super added. Exceeding abundantly, supremely. Something further, more, much more than all, uh, superior, extraordinary, surpassing uncommon. Uh, uh, advantage, more eminent, more remarkable, more excellent. Jesus Christ came that we would have a more excellent, uh, a super added, supremely exceeding, extraordinary, <laughs> remarkable life. That's why Jesus Christ came. Our God is not just a just enough God. And when God says, I will be your sufficiency in all things, he's not saying, I'm just going to give you enough. God is saying, I can give you more than enough. And we're going to look at that. Our God is an excessive God. He is a too much God, almost. Which is awesome. <laughs> Good. That's, it. That's actually where I want us to be at the end of this teaching. Good thing we're there already. We all go home. Second Kings. Chapter 4. What I want to do with this teaching is expand the horizons of the realm of our possibility, but the realm of probability in our own believing with God. I don't want to compartmentalize it to only spiritual truths. I want to open it up to all truths. You know, the word Zoe, or the word life is the Greek word Zoe, and it means life in all of its manifestations. So a more abundant life is an exceeding superior awesome life in all of life's manifestations. Emotionally, physically, financially, securely. You know, I mean, the list goes on and on. And so let's go to Second Kings. Amen. Yeah. You can get it, you can shout a hallelujah if you guys want to find it. Silence in the church. Second Kings four, <laughs> verse one. And this is Elisha. And it says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knows that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. See, in the Old Testament, those times, when the creditor was coming to collect your things, if you didn't have the money, they didn't just, you couldn't just claim bankruptcy and then your credit score is messed up. They took your sons, they took your wives, and they took your stuff, and they sold them into slavery. And that's, and if that wasn't enough, they took you, and you became a slave. That was the uh, system of the Old Testament, all right? So, you can see the plight of this, uh, this widow's um, situation. Verse two, and Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. So the creditors had already come in a big fashion, because the only thing left in her house is a pot of oil. It's the only thing left. Verse 3. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Now, if God tells you, to go out and do something, like borrow pots. And he says, borrow not a few. You should be putting an ad in the newspaper for pots, right? <laughs> you should be collecting pots from across the neighborhood and the globe, all right? Verse four, and we'll see why. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all these vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is what? Full. Full. Verse 5. So she went from him, shut the door upon her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. All of the pots that she was able to find from her neighbors instructed not just a few pots, but all the pots you could find have all become full now with oil, right? And remember, this is a woman in debt who's a widow. Verse seven, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. 
more than abundant life is available for us. The thing that is awesome about this record is what God paralleled, his supply paralleled how much pots this woman wanted to bring. If she wanted to borrow more pots, you know, there's no indication in the record that said, and she borrowed them all. God filled to the brim, to the point where the whole house is paid off, and then they get to pay it off the rest. Now that is provision from God on commerce and economy, that is provision from God on peace of mind and security, and that is more than enough just to pay the debt. That is more than enough. It's enough to take care of them economically from then on even more so. Right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Awesome. Witness. So God's supply matches the numbers of pots with the woman, okay? Now, what I want us to think on is use these pots as a symbol of our believing, yeah? That our believing could be like these pots. God's going to fill it all. you got to bring more pots. you got to bring more believing, potentially. More than enough is our God. Matt 14. Let's go to Matthew 14. Somebody want to read verses 14 through 16? Awesome, Shane, go ahead. <laughs> Verse 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Awesome. So the disciples come to Jesus, right? And they think they're going to give him some great sound advice. You know, oh, you've been preaching enough, Jesus. <laughs> Send the, the multitudes away because they need to eat. Jesus Christ, very cool, chill, laid back, awesome. Smoothest dude alive, responses. <laughs> no, let them stay. And we'll give them to eat. Uh, go ahead and... Uh, Read 17 through 21, Shane. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he, he said, Bring them hither to me. Verse 19. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And verse 20, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. Verse 21, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Now, how many of y'all know that God understands when they were all full? You understand that God understands when all these people were done eating, <laughs> that they had their fill, right? But still, there were twelve baskets left over. Now, they started off with five loaves of bread and two fishes. I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, God knew that they were filled up to a point. But they ended because of the occlusion of God, because of Jesus Christ praying over the food. They ended with more than they even began with. Right? Mm -hmm. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Now, if we take into consideration, this is just the men. Okay? So, 5,000 men excluding or beside women and children all right and if you an average family we're gonna do we're gonna give them each man has a wife and one child i think that's a pretty easy average to do because some families have three children you know yeah, yeah. so that's a good average that's fifteen thousand people fed off of five loaves of bread and two fishes with god's ordained provision with god's giving and god's power included in this that's more than enough for these people. Twelve baskets more, to be a little bit more exact. And God and Jesus Christ came in ours for us so that we would have a super exceeding, super abounding, more than abundant life. Now, this isn't just in the spiritual realm. When we read in John 10.10, 10, check the context, 
What I have seen as an error a lot is that people think that that more abundant life is referencing only heaven. That it's referencing only us in the next life. You can't find that in the context when you read that in John 10.10. 10. This is the more abundant life, the super exceeding, extraordinary life available to the believer now. Now, it is available, much like Joshua going and claiming the promised land, Canaan, in the Old Testament. Now, it was always available for them in the Old Testament, right? Canaan was available. God said, go claim the land. But they saw these obstacles in front of them, right? They saw giants, kingdoms, the walls of Jericho. They saw all these things, and some of them became afraid and said no. But they said no because they didn't believe God. God said, yes, this is available. Claim it. It's yours. But they didn't because of fear, distraction, what have not. I'd like to parallel that to us. Don't let the giants and the walls of Jericho and the kingdoms in this world now scare you away from claiming what is yours and what is available now, which is the more abundant life. Now, I feel like already we have so many stories of victory in this fellowship about just seeing great things. I've talked to Shane about plane tickets. He'll give you an ear. Hallelujah! <laughs> right? Right? We already have that. Right? And it's great, and it's produced fruit in our own lives, right? We've been serving great. But, but who's with me in seeing that we can do more, that we can see more? I want yeah. that more abundant life. Yeah. I want to grab yeah. it. And that's the, and if God says that's mine, that is mine, you know? And so, cool. So, uh, let's go to Matthew 15. 15. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, there's two records with the loaves and the fishes, and we're going to hit them both, and they're one chapter away from each other. I want you to keep that in your mind as we go forward. So, uh, Sarah, tell me, you want to read Matthew 15, verse 29? Sure. And through 39. 29 through 39. I think. Yes. And Jesus departed from thence, and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee, and went up into a mountain, and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. And so much that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples said unto them, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven and a few little fishes. <coughs> and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks and brake them, and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came unto the coast of Nazareth. There you go. It's interesting that a chapter before this miraculous event happened, right? And you would think this is a once in a lifetime event. And Jesus doing some awesome, crazy miracle. Jesus Christ, his life was just riddled with this, right? All the books in the world couldn't hold all the great things that he'd done. What's interesting to see is the disciples in this. Because the disciples just saw this a chapter earlier, and all of a sudden, when the same circumstance comes up, Jesus Christ is once again preaching to another multitude of people. He's once again healing the sick and the blind and the lame. And then once again, Jesus Christ says, Turn them not away, lest they faint. Let's feed them. And the disciples' response is, where are we going to get all the food in the wilderness? A chapter prior, a chapter <laughs> prior, they were like, they asked the same question pretty much, saying, there's no way we can do this, how are we going to do this? And Jesus Christ said, well, give me those friggin' loaves of bread and those fishes, I'm going to pray over this, and we're going to get this done. He gave thanks, break it, fed 15,000 people roughly, right? A chapter later, the exact same thing. Now, once again, God understands when the people are full, if God wanted to be a just enough God, there wouldn't have been seven baskets left over. Why have seven baskets left over? But our God is a more than abundant God. who sent His Son, Jesus Christ, that we would have a more than abundant life. 
not only in the spiritual benefits, which are amazing, everlasting life, hey oh, I mean, come on, you know, that we are made right with God, that we have peace, but the now, the going in and out of the pasture, the lying down in green fields and having things to eat, being provided for, and having a surplus to receive and a surplus to give, that is a more abundant life. All right, let's go to Luke 5. Let's go to another uh, example of this. Now, this is cool because this is Jesus Christ, and this is him calling the very first disciples, right? This is him uh, calling Simon and a few others who are fishermen. And in Luke 5, Vince, you want to read verse uh, 1 through 4? Luke 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. Uh, go to verse 5. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down thy net. Awesome. So, Simon and his boys are master fishermen. They know how to fish. If anything, they know how to fish. In fact... Uh, Simon later on, after Jesus Christ gets crucified, gets in despair and goes, Alright guys, we go fishing. And he goes fishing, because all he knew was Jesus Christ, God's word, and fishing. Which is more than enough, by the way. But he goes fishing. So this is Simon's thing, right? His thing is fishing. He knows the ins and outs. Master of fishermen. This is his first contact, or first face-to-face -face contact with Jesus Christ recorded. And it's him telling Jesus Christ, look, We've been toiling all night. We're master fishermen. Uh, we didn't catch anything. And, uh, but if you want me to, I will let down these nets. Okay? And so, verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a what? Great 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 of fishes. Of fishes. And their net did what? Great broke. Great. The net broke. <laughs> they got so many fishes... <laughs> that the device meant to hold as many fishes as possible <laughs> broke, all right? And they beckoned unto their partners, verse 7, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with them at the drought, or the booty of fishes, which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch what? Amen. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. This is cool. The calling card of Jesus Christ when he calls his first disciples is showing them that he is more than enough. Is showing them that God is more than enough. To the point where he exceeds their expertise in their master their field. And this is Simon, James, and John. I mean, these guys were pillars in the early church. I mean, these are guys we read about. And his first uh, contact with them is just showing them, hey, there's more to life than this. I am more than enough. Follow me if you want more. Let's go to Mark 10. Now I say this, and I bring this teaching of prosperity up, because I know everybody knows that God wants us to prosper. I was 3 John 2, uh, beloved, I wish above all things that you might prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospereth. But I didn't want to compartmentalize it, and I found myself doing that in my own life, 
where I would believe hugely that God, in order for me and my service for God, would provide more than enough. And I've seen that hugely. And you have observed me live this from state to state to state, not paying a dime for a ticket, being able to teach and preach and all these things. And I believed wholeheartedly that God could do this for me. And God did. And then I found in the realm of my personal finance, I understood that God would be just enough to get me my bills paid. And guess what? He did. But that's all. Just enough was where I was stopping. <laughs> More than abundant is where I can be. More than abundant is where you can be. God's saying it's available. My son has come that you would have an exceedingly extraordinary life in all of its manifestations and it's there and it's available if you claim it and if we learn from the Israelites to believe it because we can understand this concept I understand the concept of prosperity do I believe the concept of prosperity yes now I do and I think you guys should too in our works of this fellowship particularly, the thing I love about running an in-home fellowship is I can address all of you very personally. If, they, if, if this gets to 3,000 people big, which I thoroughly hope it does, I won't be able to look 14 of you in the face and understand that you understand exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about our fellowship and the things that we're doing. We have been really focusing a lot on service, and I have seen fruit produced in each one of your lives immensely. And it has produced fruit in my life and has inspired and motivated me. And we're going to keep doing that. And I want to equip with our giving and our serving the expectation to receive from God. The believing that God will give us more than abundantly, not because of you know, how righteous we are, but because how much he loves us and that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, for the sole reason that we would have more than abundant life. Amen. 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 So Luke 6, actually no, Mark 10, sorry. Mark 10. We're going to read this. And it says in verse 30, or verse 29, actually no, let's take it verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels. 30. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in which time? This, this time. time. This time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with what? Persecutions. Persecutions. Ooh, that's an interesting thing. Persecutions and in the world to come, eternal life. So a hundredfold in this time now. I understand what that means. Do I believe that? Do I believe that as I give and as I lay aside more of the world in my life and pick up my cross for, God, for Jesus Christ and for God, that God is going to restore and see that and respond a hundredfold? <coughs> I believe that now. And I like it that it says persecutions here. Because as you receive from God, and as we really expand our believing, and really, really get to the point where we are allowing <coughs> God to really give to us. Not just saying it. Not just saying, oh, God wants me to prosper, and not really believing it, because that happens a lot of the time. But really believing that God's going to supply all our needs, that he's sufficient for everything, that it's not just, it's not just a just enough life, that, I, that I'm not just being in poverty and lack because there's some divine message in that which happens a lot. I mean, there are points and there are believers who have gone through poverty and lack and have done immense and great things, but that doesn't mean that your walk with God is exclusively tied to poverty and lack. That doesn't mean you have to suffer lack. When I read this book, I see that there is an option available more than abundant life, to be abundant in all these things as we believe and we walk and as we open our minds to receive from God. Really, I see that. Um, but as we receive, we're going to experience a lot of joy. I mean, we're going to be filled up to the brim with joy, with happiness. We're going to have more to give. It's going to be inspiring. But let me tell you something. The more you receive from God, the more persecution you're going to get. It's going to happen, and it comes in a lot of different forms. For example, one of the, one of the forms is, is the worldly idea of a Christian 
that why does that person have a nice car? Let me tell you, it's very, very available to praise God in a Lexus. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very, very available to praise, acknowledge, and revere God in a nice house. It is very available to prosper and be meek and humble before God. It doesn't, you don't have to put on this exterior pious morality and like look how friggin' spiritual I am because I pushed away all material blessing and I stand now in rags as this holy man. <laughs> that doesn't need to happen, okay? <laughs> no, no, it can happen and if that is God's decision for your life specifically, okay, then there's something even better for you there. But don't tie that exclusively to the Christian walk. Don't tie it. In fact, you tie exclusively to the Christian walk. Prosperity. We've been reading God's word, right? We've been seeing these wonderful things, right? This is God speaking to us. Cool. So, with receiving from God, there is also naysayers, gainsayers, persecutions, mental pressures, really, tribulations, trials that come with that. And that's great. I am for that. <laughs> Bring on the persecution, honestly. If, if, if it's a persecution that comes as a byproduct of receiving more from God and expanding my believing and really, really seeing that in my life, being able to give more, awesome. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go to Psalm 81. In Psalm 81, verse 10, it says, Mike, do you want to read that? I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. There you go. Open thy mouth what? Wide. 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 Um, <coughs> in Mark 10, 30, it, it began, it said, um, Oh, actually, no, we're going to get there. But open thy, thy mouth wide that I might fill it. Um, God doesn't want to just, you know, throw you uh, some cookies and be like, hey, look, these are the benefits. He wants you to prove it. He wants you. He says, make your expectation big of me is another way to say that. Expect from me largely. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill it. I'm going to fulfill that expectation in your life. But you got to believe that. you got to expect that. Let's go to Luke chapter 6. And one way that we can serve, and one way that we can see fruits produced in our lives, and see a response and a cycle of giving and receiving is by ta -da, giving, which is the first word in this verse 38. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, or the same measure that you measure out, it shall be measured to you again. One way to jump into this receiving cycle that God has available for us is to give. Now, this is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to teach this tonight, because we have become a fellowship that has become doers and givers in many ways. Services, USO, down in Alaska, we're doing things, and I wanted to bring to your attention that we are doing that. And once again, we are doing that, we're producing food, and we can do that more. And I think that we want to be a fellowship that does that more. And the cool thing about it is it says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. See, in the, in the bazaars, right, in the, in, the, uh, in the swap meets of the Bible times, <laughs> <laughs> when they would say, uh, say you got a, a big bag of some type of uh, 
produce that was expensive. Or get flour or rice, you know, you can input blank here. Usually what they would do is they would fill it up with a measuring. They had different type of measuring tools where, you know, they'd say, okay, I want three measurements of it. They would get a rock and a, a measuring rock and they'd put it on a scale. And what they would do is they'd put the rock on one side and they would fill up the thing with rice until it bounced up. And then you have one measure. But here it says God's going to fill you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Which means you got your bag. He's going to fill it up to the brim. Then he's going to press it down. So that it's all compacted, fill it up more until it runs over. Now, just like God knows when those people were full, God understands when the bag is full. But he doesn't stop when the bag is full. He says, runs over. How I many of y'all know that verse in Psalm 23 that says, my cup runneth over? God knows when the cup is full. God understands, but that's not full to God. God that's not God's version of enough to him. And I just see this illustration of, like, you know, you holding the cup and getting blessings and God just pouring it into your cup and you're like, okay, I'm full, I'm full. Oh, it's going to start, it's going to start overflowing. Stop, God, stop, stop, stop. And he's going, no, 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 I know it's full. I get it. And it starts running over, getting all over everything. That's God's version of enough, all right? And so I want that to be my version of enough now, you know? It says that these things are available. I believe it. I want to see that in my life, and I want to see that in this fellowship's life. I want to see all your cups running over. I want to see the, the horizons of our believing expanded in a way where we receive more, and by receiving more, can give more. And then that, just that virtuous cycle happens where we just continue giving and receiving and all the wonderful things that we can see. So... Let's go to Psalm 23. I just referenced this first, but I think it's good for us to, to read. So God is more than more than enough. When Jesus Christ came, that we would have a more than more than enough type of life. And God is an excessive God. <laughs> He's a too much God, it's overflowing type of God. In Psalm 23, 5, and we'll close here, it says, Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anoint, anointest my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Our God is not just a just enough God. Our Savior Jesus Christ did not come so that we would have life more redundantly. Uh, we have a ship sinking. Net breaking, pot filling, overflowing cup type of God. And that's our God. Amen. And I want to see that growth in our lives. I want to see us as a fellowship see this, apply this in opportunity, and then come back and be able to proclaim some good works that we've seen. Right? Maybe that's why we opened up with that Psalm 105 verse. So, with that, I'll close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for uh, your version of enough. <laughs> uh, Father, we thank you for the wonderful blessings that are infinite and uncountable. Um, God, and I just ask that you work with each and every one of us here uh, to see you in that life, Father, to see you as you have proclaimed yourself to be in your word, to really grab hold of this more abundant life, uh, to believe it and apply it, and uh, to praise you because of the things that happens as a byproduct. So we look to you, Father. We thank you for everything. What a wonderful privilege and honor it is to serve you, and what a wonderful privilege and honor it is to receive from you. And I would ask that you would train us in the how, God. So, Father, we thank you for these things. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Mm -hmm. And almost in